everyone, and welcome to the Observation Deck. I am Annie Peterson Kalatkar, and with me today is Teresa T. Walsh. We have a lot to talk about today. Hello, Teresa. Hey, so Annie, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Welcome. I'm um, so excited that you're one of my early podcasters here because we have so much history of uh, boating together, escapades and adventures galore. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so let me just quickly introduce Teresa. I've known Teresa since uh, probably grammar school and uh we went to high school together and we were in Sea Scouts for four years together. And during that time, we did a lot of boat maintenance, a lot of summer cruises. We did a lot of sail racing. And then you went off to college and I went on to become a skipper of the program. And during that time, uh, you started creating all kinds of new adventures, uh, wilderness, uh, exploration and and teaching and uh, love to hear about some outward bound stuff and the type of boats that that you went to work on because i know that we all had dreams of staying connected to the water back then and working in our favorite environment didn't we mm -hmm. we sure did <laughs> so what was outward bound like well, uh, it was an interesting story how I came to Outward Bound. I actually went and took a Knowles instructor's course to uh, be a mountain rock instructor for them. And then when I was done with my course, they said, you know, they were pleased with the technical levels, but they said to me, you know, you might work for Outward Bound. And I didn't understand why, because I didn't know much about Outward Bound at that time. You should go check out Outward Bound's program. So I did, and I uh, looked into the one in the Northwest in uh, Washington, and um, I got involved with a program that was a sail mountain program. It was with my sailing background. It was a new program that they were offering. And they were like, oh, that's, that's a perfect fit. So off I went onto this program, and uh, they were about a month long courses, half sailing, and then you move from the sailing into the mountain range in the Northwest and do your backpack trip, right? And so um, we had these uh, gaff rig, um, I would say pretty much a whale boat, right? There was no motor, all under oar. Everybody had to, you know, uh, be involved, you know. Pull their and, weight. Yes, you had to pull your weight. And many of the students that we had didn't expect that because they thought sailing program, yacht, right? Or motor or something they just so they would have these young folks who maybe their parents signed them up or something like that and they saw the pictures online and it looked like you're going to just relax the sun and everything else and we did a lot of rowing <laughs> because they're gaff rig so they don't do well unless the wind's coming directly behind them Right. So and then the season that we did them in in July and August is kind of at times uh, dead winds. <laughs> so you're out there in Puget Sound. Right. OK. doing the road. <laughs> so, I mean, they were they were really fun programs, you know, to do. I really enjoyed them. I like the combination of the water and the mountains. Um, I'm not sure if they're still offering those programs today um, out of Puget Sound because things have changed with the Outward Bound programs up there. But yeah, that'd be about uh, it. <laughs> so after you um, worked for them, didn't you work uh, in Wyoming for a spell doing uh, wilderness? I did, yes, wilderness mountaineering courses. Um, so, uh, and all the rope work that we did in those days in scouts, the knots and all that paid off because that was where I, I excelled, right? And just all the repetitive, you know, so they were like, okay, a bowl. Oh, well, I know what that is, right? It was anything that came up because there's a lot of um, stuff that you use in sailing that you also use in, in the mountain range, you know? 
So um, that was quite helpful. And uh, those were like 30 day programs. And, um, you know, a lot of, you know, snow and crevasses and a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of rope work. <laughs> Now, are the names for not similar or do they get adjusted for rock climbing? Well, you have your figure eight series knots, right? Your Flemish bend, your overhand, you know, figure eight uh, on a, a bite, right? And then your figure eight follow through. Those are the ones that we primarily use in, in the climbing. We do use Bolins with backup which is a little different than the sailing because you want releasability in the sailing and you don't want releasability on the mountaintop. <laughs> so you're always backing off those and not uh, those with like a double fisherman. Yeah. So that's a little bit different there because the releasability is important, right? In the sailing to release the sails if need be. Right. But you know, when you're on uh, rock climbing and things like that, you know, you want more security. So they, you know, you use them in different, in different ways, but they used to do a uh, bowling on a coil a lot in the mountaineering realm in the day, um, because years ago they didn't have harnesses. So that's what you would tie into the rope with, which, you know, it was kind of similar to what we did to go up the mast. <laughs> right. So what Teresa's is talking about is we would make a, um, uh -oh double bowl in, yes. which had two loops and you put your leg through each loop and yes it was very painful it was very uncomfortable and the bowling on the coil for a mountaineer is very painful too except yeah. for the difference is instead of putting your leg through each loop both loops are around the waist yeah right so it's very uncomfortable if you slip you know on steep terrain it's not going to feel good right. right just the way it was didn't feel good to go up the mass <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So in terms of sailing, there's a responsiveness that we all learn to adapt to uh, on the fly, as it were, um, because problems happen and you have to respond immediately. Did you find that that was true out in the wilderness or uh, because, you know, um, you know, things happen differently on a boat than they do on land. But I'm sure there are some similarities when, for example, someone starts to slide down a mountain. It's it, you have to react very quickly. Oh, yes. Yes. You know, if you're, uh, you know, in crevasse territory, for example, you know, you need to have a quick response and the whole team's going into the crevasse. Right. So you have to, you know, you know get ready, you know, that type of thing. Although I never had an incident, you know, in crevasse terrain where we had to, you know, someone fell in, in my experience, but I know others who have, you know, but I think most of what I noticed was weather conditions similar to in the sailing realm, right? Weather conditions come in and then it changes everything and you have to be efficient, right? You have to decide, do you turn around? What course are you heading on? those types of uh, things, right? So that you can quickly resolve a potentially bad situation that could occur. That was pretty classic. And, and it always reminded me of the time when our skipper and we were out on the bay and the winds were heavy out on the bay and the cleat got caught. So the sheet couldn't go out and the boat was flipping to the side and the water was hitting. And we had all our parents on board for the family sale <laughs> and I was, I, I, yeah, I was up in the front, right? Just enjoying the waves and hold on, woo, right? And then all of a sudden something changed and we all came running back and our skipper was like, well, what do you think we all ought to do? And he was very patient, not, not rushing anything. And you know what I mean? And in my mind, I thought, wow, maybe this is a situation to be a little concerned, like, shouldn't he be deciding what we're doing right now? Is this a lesson plan, right? That's what was going on in my head, right? But what I learned from our skipper that day was to be calm and react to crisis. That was a beautiful moment for me because of his calmness, I wasn't stressing out about the boat flipping or you know other things that could be happening. It was like, 
when the day they say in the mountaineering, smoke the cigarette and then deal with the problem to a certain degree. So you can get your mind around how to approach it, right? Without stress, because you might make poor decisions in stress. And that's what I learned from our skipper that day. And so there were plenty of times in the mountains that I had to go into that place <laughs> and just go deep breath. Okay. Yeah, breathe. All right. Here's lightning, right? I was on top of Whitney. I was um, taking a couple of teenage boys up there as a, you know, an experience. And we got lightning on top of that mountain and we had to make some pretty crucial decisions and everybody did well. And right. But it was that deep breath. I didn't go into, ah, I was like, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> I think you bring up an excellent point, which is yeah. everything related to the water cultivates that you know, inner navigation that the, the leadership, self-leadership so that you can mm -hmm. lead others. And which is why I always encourage every, uh, teenager to get involved in some sort of sailing or boating program, even windsurfing or other, you know, program, because the weather is always different. The wind is always different. Um, the tidal conditions are different. The water temperature is different. The people around you are different. Your equipment could, uh, you know, it ages. And mm -hmm. sometimes even new equipment needs to be broken in. And so it's, it's, um, it's just an environment that provides so many variables that the experience is never, ever the same. And yes, even though ever. It, it never, <laughs> ever was, I mean, I can't say, yeah, I have never had an experience that exact. No, they're all so unique. Each yeah, and every you one never of them. could replicate an yeah. experience. Even if you brought the same people with the same sandwiches oh. on the same day, no. with the same weather predicted. <laughs> no, no <chance. laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, being in the, the environment of the Marine environment, we learned quite early on to be in the moment because yes. if you're caught up in what happened in the past, uh, you're not paying attention, which means you're putting yourself and others at risk. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, future tripping on what could go wrong or, you know, out to lunch daydreaming, uh, you know, about what shape the clouds are, <laughs> <laughs> which I was known to do. You, you may not be prepared or ready in the moment. Um, so, you know, it, it's really great training for being in your body in the moment and, you know, very aware. present. Yeah. Very present and aware. Right. Um, and that's one thing I, I, I learned, you know, and in more recent times, I got involved in a meditation program that's about body and your awareness. Mm -hmm. And when I started the meditation, it felt like home to me because that's what I was doing before I had family. Right. And when I was in the mountains, I was in that place a lot and I had forgotten sort of, you know what I mean? About what that was as I got back into the city life and having to be able to use that same sort of in the moment presence in everyday experiences. Right. Um, it's very helpful life skill. I agree. I think even, um, uh to just being on a boat and participating in the process of, of moving that boat from point A to point B, mm -hmm. or even just doing a, a project on the boat, it requires focus. And what inspires um, that meditative state is just the motion of the water, uh, mm -hmm. becoming one with the boat. All of your cares that are on shore are forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. then you have all this blue sky, which scientifically we know that uh, being able to take in a large expanse of blue is very healing for the for the mind, for the psyche. It, it has a very calming effect. And just being out of nature, of course, but there's something about being on the water that is extremely therapeutic. So Teresa, tell us, um, how would you say that sailing and the, the, you know, Sea Scouts really is like a junior sailing program. It's just not through a yacht club. 
Um, although I suspect there may be some Sea Scout programs that have Yacht Club sponsorship these days. Um, what would you say uh, about how the, the sailing program impacted your ability to solve problems in life? I would say that, um, like we were talking before, like being in the moment, having patience, understanding that conditions change, right? It's not always going to be the same, right? Dealing with stress it was very helpful with that, right? Because of the amount of shifting and changing to be able to adapt to new situations, you know, instantaneously, like one would have to do in a sailing scenario. Um, and same goes with the mountaineering. They were very similar in that way. Um, yeah. So what was one of the most difficult situations you were ever in on the water that, you know, clearly you survived to tell the tale? Well, <laughs> well I would say, well, that, that situation with our skipper was one of those situations. <laughs> But what there was another do? situation where we had the 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 man the person overboard drill. <laughs> do you remember that one? Those were always challenging because we yes. had a sailboat that was a full keel, and yes. it did not point into the wind to to stop. And it took us a while to figure out that we actually had to put the boat um, a beam to the wind so that the sails could you know kind of flog. Uh, mm -hmm. off the side and not stream center line. And it wasn't until we figured that out because our boat that we were using was a 26 foot Choyley Frisco flyer. And the problem is that it was designed in a way to self sail, right? With, with yes. you know, tie off the tiller yeah. and it could hold a 45 degree uh, sailing point. Yeah. Um, so the boat naturally wanted to round up into the wind and then fall off to 45 degrees. So it was a very challenging boat to get to stay headed directly into the wind. So we yes. used to have to pick up people on the side. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and it was complicated and difficult and, you know, it took longer than one would like, especially out, you know, with the bay and the current and things like that. You know they were very challenging and always i always thought in my mind you know what i mean if you know somebody you know what i mean depending on the situation we didn't get good enough with that skill right the person we're gonna it's not gonna go well that basically what to say <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> So Teresa and I used to participate in regattas that were, I like to call them Sea Scout Olympics, and they were a blast. And this was where all of the local area Sea Scout ships would meet on, for example, Coast Guard Island, participating in the Ancient Mariners Regatta. And there would be all these different events and we would have just a tremendous time. It was a competition between all the different Sea Scout ships and we would practice all year different skills from not tying for timed events. We would also do a ring buoy toss over the, a line in the water. And uh, there were bosun's chair um, hoists and there were rowing whaleboat rowing races. There was swim races. It was, it was just a, a, a really four day weekend picnic. It was great. And I'm just sharing this one time that uh, we were doing an event. Was it a uh, breaches buoy where you came yes. down? So Teresa was the smallest and the lightest mm -hmm. of all of us girls. Cause we were on an all girls sailing program. And during these competitions, only the bosun, which was the leader of the group, kind of like a coxswain or a captain, the bosun was the only one allowed to speak. So, but then once the event started, there was no talking, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Teresa had to climb up and we had to, you know, structure this, this uh, rope. And then Teresa would attach this rope swing. And then she was uh, to get from point A to point B, which was from high to low. And it represented moving cargo 
or a person from mm -hmm. one ship to the other. And so <laughs> I think you let out a big wee. Yeah. <laughs> I know. When you're coming down, and I never forgot that. I can still hear it ringing in my ears. You, you can see how I ended up being uh, uh, getting into climbing. <laughs> such great fun and um the, the sailing program is, is just a tremendous way to get um your weekends full of uh new connections and new opportunities to travel and I mean, we did all these other things too from we'd go to the ice skating rink during the oh, holidays yeah. in the winter we went and then we um, even did we even did backpack trips yes we that's did. where i got introduced to that was we went to yosemite this, yes and, and we did those ski trips and we were all wearing cotton and yeah. jeans and in the snow trying to like, like uh, trying to <laughs> deal <laughs> i didn't even know what an in-flight pad was at those days we just slept on the dirt right on our, our sailing trips you know and things you were either on the boat or on yeah. the land right and you just slept in the dirt in the old cotton bag right and you you know be chilly because the dew would come and, and you roll up your legs and you know you get through the night i thought you know i was like this is how it goes and then when I got into the outdoor programs and, and, and to college at first, you know, when they introduced, you know, I got into this outdoor programming in college, um, environmental education program. And, you know, we started doing trips. I was introduced to the Insulite pad and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> it was like, right, the cushiest experience ever, right? You know, I was like, oh, you don't have to be cold and freezing. You can insulate yeah. yourself from the ground. <laughs> I think, though, that there's something that builds that inner fortitude of, yeah, I know how to rough it. I know how Resilience. to and lay under a bunch of trees under a starry sky and lay on the dirt with my sleeping bag and, and uh, rest and get through the night. And I mean, we did all kinds of crazy things in high school, uh, you know, sleeping on whaleboats, sleeping on decks waking up yeah. with all the condensation, freezing yeah. cold. I mean, the, but when you're young and, and you're, you're just like having a good time, you don't really think too much about it. But later when, you know, you may be faced with having to stay in a foreign airport overnight and nothing yeah. to sleep in, you're, you're like mentally uh, ad adaptable to like stretching out on the carpet and and putting your head on your backpack or something yeah it, yeah it's just tremendous <laughs> you get through it when i was in the in the trains you know when i went to europe i was 17 and i did a trip to europe right and uh i was on the trains right and there was uh, seats in the hallway right but it was expensive to get a car seat where you can turn it into a room right so i was in the hall and i'd pull down the two snap chairs and put my backpack between the two and lay across them and sleep like that right and then and then every once in a while i would shuffle and the seat would flip up and then i would go rolling into the hall <laughs> into the corridor <laughs> i never knew that <laughs> yeah but see, that is exactly what sailing <laughs> teaches is innovation, innovation. problem solving, right? Exactly. You, you always know, have to be innovative, right? Exactly. With, yeah. That's correct. That's correct. Because even if like, you know, if you look at crew as a human resource and something happens to one of your crew member, everyone has to pick up the extra slack if someone gets hurt, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's always plenty of jobs on board a boat. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's just really, um, such great training for, for life because, uh, you can be at work one day and someone's out sick and, and something's due and everyone has to pitch in and it's no big yeah. deal because the, the understanding of teamwork is already, mm -hmm. uh, in, in your whole essence, you know? Well, it's like being in, um, you know, when you're in a, a group, you know, mountaineering together or sailing together or backpacking together or canoe trips. I mean, these were all things I did, right? That's your group. That's your community, right? So you start to understand the importance of community and interaction. 
and giving right without expectation. Yes. Those were the big ones for me because there wasn't going to be, you know, you don't give to get the thank you. You give because it's part of what you do, right? To be in the moment with what's happening in the moment with these people that you're with in the moment. Um, right. So it's a very different thing that you don't get a lot of experience with necessarily in the cultures, you know, of um, the, you know, the cities and the rurals and, you know, living in houses and things like that. You don't get as much of that experience as you do when, you know, you're functioning as a team for a month, you know, and I think it takes, you know, like when we'd be on those um, trips, right, summer cruise and stuff, you know, we'd be out for a, a while, right? Yeah. And so that that's when we became connected better with each other. More cohesive. Right? More cohesive with each other, kind of knew how to work together better with each other. Right. Well, so nothing that, like a yes. small, uh, you know, sardine can with six or eight people <laughs> living together, having to, you know, navigate the personal space and yeah. the limitations yes. that a boat can offer. Yes. Um, and just having to deal. Do you remember the time we got stuck in, uh, it was at Carquina, it was at Carquina Straits because the tide went down and we were heading back to the city and our rudder got stuck. And we had to sit there till the tide came up. I don't know if you remember that it was on a summer cruise. Well, and I do remember all we that. had left was prunes. <laughs> I was not on that one. That you was on that one? <laughs> that was the summer that. before I joined. Oh, that's right. That was the summer before but you joined. That's right. Similar story. We had a sail bag yeah. that uh, that had a, a big Genoa in it, and we were heading into the wind, coming back. Uh, you know, in the Carquina Strait and um, trying to get to San Pablo Bay. And so it was a, it was all upwind. And we had our Genoa in a bag that was tied uh, with just the, the drawstring from the neck of the bag. And um, I want to say a bungee cord to the, the stays. Anyways, um, I guess through friction and moisture, the, the string had been rotting unbeknownst to us. And didn't it slide overboard and it got swept yes. under the it keel yeah. into the rudder? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it jammed and we lost steering and we yeah. couldn't figure out what it was, you know? And so um, we were able to, uh, you know, turn on the engine and uh, somehow I uh, get into one of those small marinas uh, mm -hmm. near Venetia. And it was lovely. I mean, it was just unfortunate that we were, um, I, and I, I don't recall now if we had a Coast Guard escort. Um, but anyhow, it, you know, it's been so long ago. Uh, but these are little things that like pop up when you least expect it. And mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to choose uh, to move into distress and uh, fear or stay calm and choose peace and think mm -hmm. through what's going to happen. And yeah. the more times that you get through these smaller incidences, you have this uh, database inside of you that, you know, offers uh, trust and faith so that as a leader, when you step forward, you don't need proof of where you're going because you know, you already are the proof. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you, uh, you get, uh, you have, you learn to trust exactly. on a lot of different levels, you know? And yeah. how does, how did that translate? How does trust translate when you're on a sheer wall, thousands of feet <laughs> over <laughs> some well, valley? Well, you're trusting a lot of things, you know, your partner that you're with, Right. There's a lot of trust that goes into, you know, um, taking care of each other on that wall. Right. Everything that you do. And I don't think people realize this, but when you do big walls and you're on port ledges, that's like a it's like a cot on the side of a wall that you set up because there is no ledge. Right. And you're tied into the wall and and people have to, you know, do their number two and their number one. And it's a balancing act up there, 
right? There's a trust that, that they're going to balance one side while you do your business on the other, right? And there's wind and <laughs> so it's a whole balancing act. Right? A lot of trust goes on there on yeah. a lot of different levels, you know, uh, you know, or on a rope, rope team, yeah. right? A lot of trust goes into that, right? Um, just working with others and, and trusting that, you know, uh, you can't be always yelling and telling everybody what to do next. There's a, there's a sense of just letting things progress and trusting the moment and the decisions of the leader at the time, because you'll switch leads, you know, on a big wall, even sometimes on a rope team, you might switch out and then go the other way. Right. And so the person who's leading, you have to, you know, trust in what they're doing. Yes. Yeah. Very true. Very yeah. true. So you pick your partners wisely. <laughs> yes. You pick your teams wisely, right? Not everybody, right. Is, is, is prepared for that. Uh, well, know. Teresa, if ever, <laughs> if ever I am stuck on a deserted island somewhere, I want you with me. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it, it, it. I know you would never say this, but I know you are one of the top female rock instructors in the Western United States. And congratulations. Uh, you know, you and your husband have this amazing climbing school, uh, CaliforniaClimbingSchool.com. Uh, for anyone that would like to check it out, they're headquartered in Joshua Tree. And, uh, you know, your your whole life has uh, been just a, an amazing, uh, you know, accumulation of experiences that, um, you know, have led you to this moment. And, I, I'm just so happy for you and all the ways that you've been teaching leadership to everyone who comes into your classes and, and does uh, programs with you and guide you up the mountain <laughs> because you do take turns, don't you? <laughs> Part of leadership training is having letting go of the, the, the ropes, right? Well, and, yeah, well, there's a certain amount of trust involved, right, in order to teach you have to trust your student when the time is right for them yeah. to do their work, yeah. right? And so you step back in, you know, so you're leading from behind, not from the front, right? And so it's a very sense. delicate, um, you know, experience to, because people can't learn unless somebody trusts them, right? So when do you let go of the reins, you know? Right. When is it, you know, you, trust that they can do what they're going to do. Right. Right. So it's, it's quite interesting, you know, to teach and then step back, right. Rather than blah, blah, blah all the time. There's a lot of stepping back and teaching in the outdoors Correct. as the people learn and get comfortable with the skills and their body and the group and these types of things. Yeah. Well, Teresa, thank you so much for being here today. It was truly a delight to spend this time with you and, I definitely want to have you come back and share some of those crazy stories. Uh, we, we didn't even get around to you chasing a bear up a mountain. Because I, <laughs> I thought it was my group that I was supposed to meet to go meet to go climbing. And I was in the brush. <laughs> and then I was chasing him down to let him know, hey, this we're over here climbing, right? And uh, all of a sudden I realized I was chasing a bear. And the bear was running for me because <laughs> I was so loud. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. So, folks, she has plenty of stories like this. <laughs> so, once again, Teresa, thank you so much. And yeah. um, we'll see you again on the observation deck sometime. Okay. All right. Well, it was a joy talking with you today. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for right. sharing your life stories. All right. Take care. You too.